making the Chinese Communist Party a top priority. The American people have recognized, according to several recent polls, that the Chinese Communist Party is the top adversary for the United States. And the past two administrations have agreed that it's the number one threat to America. Perhaps the most critical part of confronting the Chinese Communist Party is to deter it from attacking Taiwan. The incidence of Chinese military activity around Taiwan has skyrocketed in recent years, leading many experts in Washington uh, to conclude that China could attempt to seize the island in the coming years. Taiwan, by contrast, is a vibrant democracy that just conducted another free and competitive election. It is a top 10 trading partner with the United States, and one expert's calculated trade with Taiwan supports 200,000 jobs here in the United States. If China attempts to invade Taiwan or destroys or captures the facilities that produce over 90% of the world's advanced semiconductors, then the impact on the US and the world economy would be grave indeed, leading to what could be many trillions of dollars in damages. Moreover, China would have nearly total control of the Taiwan Strait, where half the world's container ships and 90% of the largest container ships transit every year. A new paper by heritage scholar Michael Cunningham makes the case to strengthen deterrence of such an invasion and to provide Taiwan the weapons and supplies that it needs to secure itself and defend itself. Today, we'll hear from Michael, but first we're going to hear from Heritage President Kevin Roberts on his recent trip to Taiwan, where he and Michael and some others met with Taiwan's outgoing and incoming presidents. Taiwan, in addition to a flourishing democracy, also ranks fourth in Heritage's own Index of Economic Freedom. Conducting an interview of both Dr. Roberts and then Michael Cunningham is Heritage's Director of the Asian Studies Center, Jeff Smith. Jeff and several colleagues wrote the major work, Winning the New Cold War, a plan for countering China that was released exactly one year ago today. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Kevin Roberts and Jeff Smith. Good morning. Thanks to everyone in attendance. Thanks to everyone watching at home, everyone watching in Beijing, friends around the world. Especially in Beijing. <laughs> uh, we have a great program here for you today um, and, a, and a special guest to kick off the discussion. Dr. Roberts, thank you for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Always, always good to be with you, Jeff. Dr. Roberts came to the Heritage Foundation uh, over a year ago promising to make China a priority and he has followed through on that pledge. I've seen him become personally invested in some of our, our struggles and our, our efforts um, to, to make better legislation on China, to make better policy on China, and to push back against the CCP. He also wrote a fantastic commentary last October titled, We're in a new Cold War. It's time our politicians started acting like it. I'd encourage you all to read that. It's one of the better things I've read on China in quite some time. Despite the considerable demands on your schedule, you took a trip to Taiwan and Japan in late February and early March. And we have a few minutes here with you today where I hoped you could share some observations. What compelled you to take that trip at this time? Well, first, <clears throat> first of all, I was very happy to go. I was looking forward to doing that. But the, in sort of descending order of priorities, and all of these are important reasons to go, the first and most important is because it is in America's vital interest. It is in every individual American's vital interest for us to know Taiwan firsthand as a friend and an ally. And so given the privilege that I have in leading this great institution and working with real experts like you, Jeff, and Michael, who we'll hear from in a minute, it was good to, to go firsthand. The second is looking at it from the perspective of the Taiwanese, it's, it's important that people across the world know the plight of Taiwan. Now, the plight, as you uh, or Derek outlined, is very positive in many respects, economically, socially, culturally. Taiwan's culture is beautiful. Taiwanese people are wonderful and beautiful and warm. And, and I like to say, as an adopted Texan, that Taiwan is the Texas of Asia. That's the highest compliment that an adopted Texan can give. You see my, my, my Texas flag I wear every day until we close the border. But the third thing is, from the standpoint of the United States, 
there are only three or four countries whom, if they were attacked, would directly affect how our lives go the very next day. At the top of the list, don't forget this, Great Britain. It's unconscionable that they would somehow be attacked, but just imagine a world that if that were to happen, how that would change the United States. Secondly, Israel, that's happened and happening. The third would be Japan. We appreciate that, but not as much as we should. Japan, and, and our Japanese friends know I mean this with, with great sincerity and, and intended as a compliment, we should see Japan as the Great Britain for us of Asia. And fourthly, but although not necessarily fourth on the list, is Taiwan. And for us at Heritage, it's vital to be able to tell that story to American policymakers, who, to their credit, across the political aisle, there are many Democrats who deserve as much credit for recognizing this as Republicans. We have to understand that defending Taiwan, and, and by that I mean in every respect, including economically, diplomatically, is in the vital interest of the United States. Very well said. So I know you had a jam-packed schedule while you were in I remember Taiwan. that. <laughs> in both countries, you met the um, outgoing president, the incoming president. You met a, a range of senior officials, um, defense officials, economic officials. What were some of the bigger takeaways from your meetings? Uh, top of mind for me, as a, as a historian, I just pay attention to culture, to people, what you know, people are saying on, on the sidewalk, in the hotel, and so on, is it's just such a cheerful and vibrant place. And that's, that's actually the main reason that I call it the Texas of Asia. It's also a great economic engine, a great place for innovation and entrepreneurialism, which, which are takeaways. But secondly, as it relates to some of the official meetings, if, if you will, members of government, uh, incoming president, the outgoing president, the wonderful combination of resolve for the benefit of the Taiwanese people and also the savvy and artfulness of how to navigate that. And because at Heritage, we, we do something with the study of not just diplomacy, but that barely scratches the surface of what I'm trying to get at, but it's statecraft. There are a few states in this world, a few countries that are excellent at statecraft and Taiwan is one of them. In fact, the United States can learn a lot from them. But then the third thing would be, and this is coming entirely from us, no one in Taiwan would, of course, ask us to say this on their behalf. We, we, we couldn't and wouldn't if, if they had. This is coming from our own analysis. We have to do better in the United States, particularly in the United States Congress, although it's done a pretty good job of delivering on what we promise, whether that be munitions, whether it be diplomatic decisions, and that is both a Republican and Democrat opportunity and challenge. Very well said. Um, since returning from Taiwan, I have heard you use uh, the word indispensable to describe Taiwan and its, and its centrality to U.S. security and economic interests. I don't recall you using that word prior to the trip. Something must have changed your mind. Yeah, it's the value of, of seeing firsthand what the world would be like, what the United States would be like if, God forbid, Taiwan were invaded. And again, just with my parochial hat on as an American, which of course is totally appropriate, people from certain countries need to place as the top priority the, the, the needs of their nation state. If Taiwan were invaded, America would be a poorer place. America would be a less safe place. But also, there would be a chain reaction. During the first Cold War, we're in the second one with China, we operated with the thesis of a domino effect, which was real. The Soviet Union initiated that. Make no mistake, the Chinese saber rattling toward Taiwan is born out of the same saber rattling they do to us in the United States and if I may be really blunt, Jeff, Taiwan is indispensable if something like that scenario were to happen. But it's also indispensable if hopefully that doesn't happen. It causes us in the United States to realize the number one enemy in the world in the history of this great country, the United States, is the Chinese Communist Party. As awful as the Soviet Union was, as awful as Nazi Germany was, as much as we disliked the United Kingdom in the 1770s and 1780s, 
the Chinese Communist Party is the gravest threat to this country and to free people ever in the history of this country. Taiwan helps us remember that. What's at stake if something happens to them? Mm. Very well said. You also spent some time in, in Tokyo while you were in Asia, and I wonder if you had any observations to share with the group about your time in Japan. Equally wonderful visit. My first yeah. time in Japan as well, and also struck by beautiful culture and wonderful people. And, and although I knew the following, I didn't know it as clearly as I do now. And that is the strength of the Japanese-US alliance is as important as the strength of the US-United Kingdom alliance. And in fact, the growing friendship, the growing formal alliance of those, our three countries, is important not only for the people who live in each of those places, it's extraordinarily important for Taiwan in particular. And so the, the Biden administration deserves some credit for continuing that friendship. We think it should be even more robust and expanded and whether President Biden wins a second term or President Trump wins a second term, you can count on the Heritage Foundation to be not just advising, but encouraging vehemently the continuation of that. We ought to be, as Americans, extremely grateful for the, the courage that the Japanese have taken in mustering more money for defense for reasons we understand, a very difficult political situation for them. But they're doing it, and they're happy about it. And I should say, Jeff, that I think I left Tokyo, coming back to, to Virginia, optimistic that we're actually going to avert war because we, at least in the near term, because we in the United States, although it's been very late in the game, have come to realize what's at stake finally. Well, it's nice to end on an opti optimistic note for once. I'm getting the hook in the back. I think you're needed elsewhere. But Dr. Roberts, thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Real, real pleasure. Thank you all for being here. Michael, thanks for taking some time to talk about your paper with us this morning. You are um, very well known here at Heritage, but you are, um, you are an unknown commodity to some in the audience. So I thought maybe we could begin the conversation by you just sharing a little bit about your background and how you came to Heritage, where you were before Heritage. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I actually took a different um, path, I guess, to the think tank world than most people. I worked in the private sector. I was a political risk analyst uh, based in China, um, but actually uh, lived in, in China during two different periods. And in between that, I spent a few years living in Taiwan, where I learned quite a bit um, about the situation there. From the perspective of businesses, um, I was an advisor for businesses there. Um, and so it was, I, I guess, a, a unique perspective uh, in the think tank world, but um, uh, one that really, really, I think, changed how, how I view uh, uh, Taiwan and both and, and mainland China as well. Yeah. Well, and that experience has been um, invaluable in your time here. Uh, you've, you've done a lot of great writing um, <clears throat> over the last year and a half since I've been working with you as the director of the Asian Study Center. But this paper in particular, I think, was some of your best work. And one of the <clears throat> great benefits of the paper is that it takes uh, a narrative about Taiwan, things that we generally understand Taiwan is important to American security, Taiwan is important to global economics, and, and, and adds the fundamental, the foundational research and to support those claims. And you'd sort of dive deeper into things that we tend to sort of brush over narratively. Um, one of the important points you make is that this is about more than a struggle between, an existential struggle between democracies and autocracies. That is part of it. And we, we do like democracies, and we don't like it when they're bullied by autocracies. But it's about much more than that. Um, it's about tangible interests. It's about the security of everyday Americans and the prosperity of everyday Americans. So maybe we could start this discussion getting right into the, the thick of it. Why does Taiwan matter to the security of an average American? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and it's, um, 
Uh, it's true. It's, 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 you know, these things are maybe self-evident to those of us who, um, who spend our lives researching them and to the military strategists who, um, who you know, are, are in charge of keeping America safe. But um, it's not always self-evident to the American people and, and even the, um, the politicians who represent them. Um, so basically, you know, in one word, it's geography. And um, you know, to really take this down and, and, and really put the bottom line up front, um, it's that we do not want a war with China. That would be disastrous. And while there are some people reasonably who, who, who fear that, well, maybe by continuing to back Taiwan and to support them, we may be um, accidentally you know, pulling ourselves into a potential war with China. But it's actually the opposite is more likely to be true. Um, so I guess just, just to, to walk, walk everyone through the logic just really, really quickly, um, Taiwan is, um, it, it is physically located um, in one of the most strategic locations on Earth. As Dr. Roberts had said, um, the Taiwan Strait is extremely important for commercial uh, shipping. The Luzon Strait um, is one of the most strategic military um, uh, uh, waterways, uh, strategic waterways uh, out there. Um, Taiwan occupies a, a critical node in the first island chain. This is the chain of islands between Japan and maritime Southeast Asia that uh, really, to, to be blunt, we have China boxed in close to its, we have the People's Liberation Army pretty much close to its own borders. Now, it does operate outside of that location, but its operations are much curtailed because they cannot just operate at will. Um, if China were able to take Taiwan and, and, and control the island and the waterways around that island, uh, it would be able to break through the, the first island chain. It would be able to um, make a play for um, a, a strategic breakout into the Pacific. And if that happens, I mean, let's just think about it. Um, it it's a bipartisan agreement in the United States that the, the Chinese Communist Party is the greatest external threat to our country. Do we want to give them that kind of um, strategic advantage. Right now, we have a huge advantage over them. Um, you know, can I guarantee that disaster would strike? I cannot, but it would be possible. And, and uh, to add on to that, um, China has been very clear that it wants to dominate Asia. It wants regional hegemony, regional domination. Uh, by definition, it would have to push the U.S. military out of Asia in order to do that. And if it had Taiwan, it would be able to start pursuing that, uh, that goal in earnest. Taiwan is essential if it wants to ever have a, a regional domination. Um, so, you know, I would just, you know, remind, you know, maybe for the first long time of our, of our existence as a country, that wasn't critical to American national security. But it is now. We learned that in World War II. We learned that with Pearl Harbor. Um, we do not want an adversary to even be able to make a play for regional uh, dominance. And you know, I, I have to, I'm not saying that China would um, you know, try to plow over Asia with its military. What I'm saying, though, is that it would be working uh, very very hard to make it extremely risky, extremely costly, extremely difficult for the US military presence to remain in the Indo-Pacific. And we have Pacific uh, territory. We have Guam, for example, where we have, uh, it's a very important, um, uh, we have a lot of military assets there as well, very important military bases. Um, we. Um, we have Hawaii, we have ultimately the, the continental United States, which if China did manage to get regional dominance, and that would still be very difficult, it would be much more likely to, to result in war before it ever got to that point, which would be a disaster. But, um, but if it did ever get that, then yes, our country would be at greater, uh, 
greater, uh, more direct danger. Well, that's a very comprehensive answer, and, and there's even an additional component to the security question that you didn't touch on, which is U.S. allies in the region, <clears throat> and, and, and in particular, the Philippines and Japan. And those come to mind for two reasons. One, because we have uh, treaty obligations, and it's quite likely, many mil military analysts believe it's quite likely that China, there would be some involvement of those allies in a conflict over Taiwan. But second, because we have tens of thousands of Americans living in those countries. And if they were to be dragged into a conflict or struck preemptively, which is also quite a possibility, uh, you, would have, uh, you would have American casualties at the outset of a conflict. So the addition of our alliances so near to Taiwan complicates matters even further, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, yeah, um, Japan, uh, and the Philippines are, are right next door to Taiwan. In fact, Japan actually has an island that's closer to the main island of Taiwan than mainland China is. Um, so um, to both Japan and the Philippines, um, a, a Chinese takeover of Taiwan would be an existential threat. Now, does that mean that, that China would go and attack them after taking Taiwan? It doesn't. But it would have massive leverage over them it, it would know it. Japan and the Philippines would know it. That really affects the entire, um, uh, the entire strategic um, uh, balance in, in the region. Um, at the very least, what would happen then is US allies would uh, doubt either the will or the capability of the United States to, to defend them. And in fact, our capability to defend countries like Japan and the Philippines would be extremely weakened if then China um, was able to use Taiwan as, I, I don't want to use, I, I don't want to, um, you know, use the cliche, but um, as, as has been said for decades, an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Um, at, at the same time, um, uh, the most likely thing that would happen is that both Japan and the Philippines would be pulled into the conflict. You know, I hear a lot of people speculating how, how much would the U.S. have to twist Japan's arm for it to get involved. I think it's the other way around. You know, I, I, I don't see how Japan stays out of a war. Um, President Marcos in the Philippines has literally said on multiple occasions it would be, I, I do not see how we could possibly not be involved in a conflict over Taiwan. Um, Japan, uh, no sitting uh, prime minister is going to say it this bluntly, but uh, Shinzo Abe, after stepping down, um, literally said um, that a, a Taiwan emergency would be a Japanese emergency and an emergency for the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, I think that was pretty clear what he meant. So, you know, they would be involved, and they are our allies. We have a, a security commitment to them. It's very hard to, to picture the U.S. ever being able, even if uh, the president at the time was insistent on staying neutral, it's very hard to picture the U.S. ever being able to stay out of a war if it were to break out. Uh, that's, if, if I may, because I've, I've had the opportunity to read your paper, uh, one of the additional points you make that I think is worth uh, emphasizing here is that there may be a popular perception that uh, a Chinese takeover of Taiwan would somehow settle the differences between the United States and China, and that perhaps Beijing would be placated um, and would somehow become more... Uh, subdued in its external behavior. And I think you make a fairly compelling case in this paper that, in fact, it's much more likely that the opposite is true, and that a Chinese takeover of Taiwan would only embolden Beijing to act more aggressively, and it would now be in a stronger position to do so, and would be in a stronger position to threaten U.S. interests and U.S. territory. And so I think that was an important challenge to the conventional wisdom. But um, I do want to make sure we have enough uh, time to dive into the second aspect of of um, why Taiwan is so important to America, and that is that is in the economic realm. So, um, summarize for us briefly why everyday Americans' prosperity 
would be affected by uh, a takeover or a conflict over Taiwan. Yeah, you know, on the surface, it looks like it wouldn't be, right? Um, Taiwan is dominated by very small companies, um, uh, family companies, um, you know, little uh, manufacturers that produce like maybe one thing. Um, in reality, um, you know, for a couple reasons that I'll explain, uh, if war were to break out over Taiwan, it would probably, almost definitely, result in, in a, a, a global economic depression. That's depression with a D. And there are a couple reasons for this. I, I would say, you know, this isn't just me talking. Um, Bloomberg recently wrote that it would be 10% of global GDP. And, and I think you can easily make a case that it would be even more than that. Um, two reasons. Semiconductors, um, this has been talked about uh, so much that I, I um, you know, I, I, I don't think um, I, I don't I don't think it's it's um, it, it's new to anyone here. But but Taiwan is the uh, leading um, producer of semiconductors, and the most advanced chips it basically produces ninety two percent. That's almost a monopoly. Um, but what most people don't understand is Taiwan's role in global manufacturing. This was the most fascinating thing that came out of my research for this paper. Um, uh, the, the whole global economy, um, the manufactured economy, uh, is, is basically built around a model of contract manufacturing. And Taiwan, Taiwanese firms sit right at the center of this, this model. Um, so um, you know, uh, there, there's a couple ways this plays out. One is Taiwan actually has a ton of, um, they're called, uh, uh, invisible champions. And if there's any uh, bilingual economist who wants a fascinating uh, research topic, I would look into Taiwan's invisible champions. Um, they uh, produce some of the most sophisticated yet boring um, uh, components that are absolutely essential for stuff like electronics. Um, we're talking like high performance screws that go into um, heavy infrastructure, uh, uh, aerospace systems. These are not things that can just be replaced overnight. Uh, there's a lot of uh, intellectual property, actually, that goes into them, into blending the different metals and whatnot. It's just, it's extremely difficult. And Taiwan is one of the only places that has companies that can produce these things. Now, uh, looking um, at, at the, I guess, the more visible side of things, um, so these, these specialized um, components, many of which are made in Taiwan, but you know, they come from all over the world, um, they're often sent to China or to other places where then um, uh, you know, factories manufacture everything from tennis shoes to, uh, to computers to uh, smartphones, uh, the consumer products that we use. They may be stamped made in China or made in Vietnam. They're often made by Taiwanese companies. Those are the biggest players in this. Um, and so essentially, if something were to happen, an emergency in the Taiwan Strait, a, a war, um, we can basically, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing would come to a standstill. Um, the way the Financial Times put it last year in an article they wrote about this, um, they said, even if we could miraculously manage to move all semiconductor manufacturing to the United States and something happened to Taiwan, the result would be made in America chips and nothing to put them in. So just think about that. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, uh, one of the interesting points you make on the semiconductor issue is that I think we all generally have a sense that it would be difficult to replicate what Taiwan has done here because they've developed this industry over decades. The experience, the expertise, the industry clusters, the supply chains. Um, but we almost have a real world example at how difficult it is to replicate what Taiwan has done because China has been trying to do it now for many years and has been uh, failing spectacularly. So do you want to flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So, so Taiwan has been developing uh, its 
uh, semiconductor industry cluster for four decades, and it has developed the most complete industry cluster uh, on the planet. Um, it is 50% cheaper to make semiconductors in China compared to the United States. So think about that. Think about how expensive things would be. Now, I'm sure that differential would go down if we had more of a, um, a critical mass in the United States. But the prospect that we can replicate what Taiwan has, has done um, you know, has been so focused and so dedicated to doing for, for four decades that we can manage to do that. I mean, as Jeff said, just look at China. <laughs> so China is extremely dedicated to doing this. Um, it has poured billions of dollars into its domestic semiconductor industry since 2015. Its goal was 40% uh, self-sufficiency by 2020 and 70% self-sufficiency by, by uh, 2025, next year. So it has done, I would say, about as well as can be expected. Um, so they have managed by last year to achieve up to uh, people believe it's 20% uh, semiconductor self-sufficiency. This is not the advanced semiconductors they need for their AI uh, development um, or even for manufacturing of, of high-end smartphones. This is more legacy, um, older model uh, uh, semiconductors. But they, they remain, dec uh, um, well, they remain at least generations behind um, the, the world leaders in, in semiconductors. So if a country that's that dedicated to their goal, that really sees it as an existential threat that they have to overcome, um, and that we know, you know seems to have endless amounts of, of cash to throw at problems, almost always finds a way to either achieve or appear to achieve its, its targets. If, if it can fail that spectacularly at this, um, and you know, it's still something to watch. It's it's dedicated to to developing its self sufficiency. It's it's um, it, it's it's still I, I guess you know a threat in that way. But um, but it's it, it's hit a lot of roadblocks, and and we would hit the same roadblocks and do that. So maybe one more question before we uh, turn it over to the audience. Another interesting wrinkle to your paper is the degree to which you tease out not only how dependent the U.S. is on Taiwan, but how dependent China is on Taiwan. And that, that reality, I think, is lost in a lot of the commentary. Were there a few facts or figures that jumped out at you? Yeah, well, I mean, just, just the, the figure that we just shared, 20% self-sufficiency means China still relies on imports for 80% of its semiconductors. So think about this. Um, its critical infrastructure, its military systems, its um, emergency services, everything that we worry about losing uh, semiconductors for, it has the same problem. But it has an even bigger problem. Um, whereas the, uh, the economic impact of a loss of, of manufacturing would be massive in the United States, in China it's not just an economic impact. China's able to, you know, it, its government can sacrifice the economy for political uh, interests. Political interests are always more important than economic interests for, for the CCP. But this is a political interest because, um, and, and, and a political threat, because um, uh, manufacturing is so important for employment in China, where they're already struggling with um, youth unemployment that's off the charts. Um, they, uh, you know, some locations in particular are dependent on Taiwanese factories for the vast majority of their employment. Uh, China worries a lot, the CCP worries a lot about the, the potential for, uh, for unrest due to social issues such as mass unemployment. So, you know, adding on to that, the fact that, okay, so, you know, what if they were to just you know, gradually move to, uh, and, and they are, they're transitioning to having more Chinese companies that are also leaders in manufacturing. But these Chinese companies also depend on semiconductors from Taiwan, uh, especially in the electronics industry. Um, and so they would still have their manufacturing shut down if, um, 
you know, if, if business across the strait were, were, uh, were, were affected or if Taiwanese businesses were just unable to operate. Um, and so that's, you know, one of many reasons that they have for not, um, not actually invading Taiwan. Um, they have an even bigger reason, which is just that it's such a sensitive issue for them politically. They're not under pressure to immediately take Taiwan, but they are under immense pressure not to mess it up and not to lose their claim over Taiwan. Um, and so just a couple things to keep in mind as we think about this really you know, seriously grave and, and, and important threat, that there's, there's another side to it as well. Thank you, Michael. Um, do we have questions from the audience? We do. Who's handling mics? OK. Uh, JB Hogan. Um, for a few years, I've tried to balance the issue saying one China versus one humanity, bringing up like the Democrats for 30 years were on the wrong track with China, appeasing, like selling out some ways. But um, more on Taiwan, it's like the art of war. Does the art of war tell China not to attack because it would be like a snake? We should bomb Beijing if they prove themselves so imperial. Have you looked at it as in their own theories of war? Would it be a mistake? Because it would like prove they are imperial to take Taiwan, that it wouldn't really be one China as a one humanity. It would be something other, more communistic, more central control. So would they be afraid of being tagged as an imperialist if, <coughs> for invading Taiwan? Just wondering, yeah, would it, is there something in Art of War like if this, you're hit by a snake, go after the head? Would the head be in China because it's expansionist communism? So, um, so it's just, oh, is it? Would, would fear of reputational damage dissuade the CCP from invading Taiwan? Uh, so fear of reputational damage um, only to an extent. You know, I'm not going to say it wouldn't at all because, because it, it, it does. It is important. But um, at the end of the day... At the end of the day, there are very few conditions under which, uh, which China currently, in the current situation, would actually use force against Taiwan. It has spelled these out in uh, three white papers in its anti-secession law. And, and basically, it's the Taiwan independence issue. As long as the status quo is maintained, which is that, you know, that, that Taiwan continues to operate as a sovereign country, um, and Beijing is able to continue saying, well, we, we own Taiwan and it is just in the process of being unified, then uh, the impediments to actually attacking are much greater than, than the benefits it would get. But you know, no question about it in my mind. They've been very clear that if the red line is crossed, even if they know they're going to lose, we're not just talking about reputational damage. But it, the reputational damage they're most worried about is their legitimacy at home. Xi's own legitimacy. He cannot afford to lose claim over Taiwan. The CCP feels it cannot either. I'm skeptical that, that, they'd, that their regime would collapse, um, as, as they seem to believe, uh, because there's no one else to take their place. They've managed to, to stomp all of that out. But, um, um, but uh, what, um, you know, it, it would be such a threat that if they judged that the, um, the risk of not showing their people that they are acting to preserve what they see as their territorial integrity um, exceeds the risk of losing a war, which would also be catastrophic for their legitimacy, um, then they would not hesitate to, to attack. And they're not going to care at all. Well, you know, it's not going to change their mind what the international community thinks. There's a question here. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Tina Chung with Voice of America's Chinese Branch. My question for uh, Michael, you mentioned about uh, uh, Taiwan being in a critical node of, of the First Island Chain. And there are some experts who uh, think that the U.S. Um, part of the uh, deterrence should be reassurance to Beijing. And by saying that, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan being in a, a, a critical note, uh, this is uh, sort of going against, uh, you know, it sort of 
like uh, U.S. is supporting the permanent separation and opposing unification. And I, I just like uh, you know uh, to hear your response to that kind of uh, thinking. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good point, and that is something that that I myself struggled with in writing this this paper. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, that is how Beijing will see it. Um, we are not calling at all for a change in the status quo. Uh, now, hopefully, hopefully those um, our, our friends listening in Beijing um, can can recognize that, um, you know, what we are advocating for is a continuation of the status quo. Now that is currently in their interest as much as it's in ours and Taiwan's interest. But you are absolutely correct that um, you know the the first island, just the geopolitical significance of Taiwan, does make it very difficult for the U.S. and China to both be happy uh, in the long run. Uh, China takes Taiwan; um, that's a critical risk for the United States. If if China yet China has its own interests at stake in wanting to uh, to take control of Taiwan as well, and and that um, that is why it's such a, a complicated issue and and so difficult and 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 is probably going to be sort of a, a Cold War like issue, just like we had to deal with a very um, uh, uncomfortable situation with the Soviet Union for decades. We are going to have to continue with an uncomfortable situation uh, with China, in particular uh, as it relates to Taiwan, for likely decades. And um, at the end of the day, it's, it, I, I, I think it'll come down to who wins the strategic competition between the, the US and China. But you know, the, the important thing is we recognize the importance of preserving the status quo and not uh, changing the status quo. And by the way, um, our friends in Taiwan, both the government and the people, overwhelmingly support preserving the status quo. Um, Taiwan independence is a fringe issue right now in Taiwan. And so that should give comfort to, um, to, to, to everyone and to those who are hoping, um, myself included, who are hoping that the US-China relation can, can be you know, as positive as it can be, given the um, the uh, uh, sort of the clash of interests that we have, not just related to Taiwan, but in general. Well, and that piggybacks off of a point you made in the paper that I thought was important, which is that we have a natural instinct in the United States to try to solve problems, uh, to fix things, and there are some problems that cannot be so easily solved. Uh, and, and sort of Taiwan status and the tensions in the Taiwan Strait, there's not a silver bullet to resolve this issue. And sometimes we just have to embrace the uncomfortable and recognize that uh, preventing a conflict over Taiwan and maintaining the current status quo may for now be the best we can do. And ultimately, we should put our energy into winning this strategic competition with China, and then our, our concerns over a, an invasion of Taiwan's, in, in the Taiwan Strait will diminish naturally. Um, Andrew, I believe we have two questions from the audience. Thanks. So both of these questions look towards a hypothetical invasion scenario. Uh, the first one, as you know, there was some conversation of if the CCP invades, let's just destroy the semiconductor fabs. Let's not let China use them. So could you talk about the idea of destroying advanced semiconductor fabs in the event of a CCP invasion succeeding or occurring? The second one looks at more from a U.S. perspective to where uh, should an invasion occur, there's some speculation that the PRC may conduct first strikes on U.S. territories, Japan as well. So could you also assess the idea and the risk of PRC first strikes on U.S. naval and Air Force facilities in places such as Guam and Okinawa? Okay. <clears throat> um, so th the question about uh, destroying advanced semiconductor um, fabs in, in Taiwan, um, that, um, 
it's, it's, it's just not, it, it's not plausible. Um, so the US will need semiconductors to fight a war, um, period. Um, now China does as well. China would like to have those semiconductors, but the, the fact of the matter is it would be extremely difficult to invade Taiwan. And so I, I don't, you know, I, I, I am aware that this is um, something that has been in the media. I am by no means um, uh, downplaying or, or faulting the, the person who asked this question. It's a very good question. It's been all over the media. Um, I think it's, the whole concept is, is, is a bit misguided um, that there is so much talk about that. Um, in that, first, I don't think it's a plausible scenario. Um, I, I think the, the real risk is that um, it would be, you know, if China did ever invade Taiwan, um, the real risk would be that it would be very difficult to prevent the destruction of semiconductor uh, fabs, um, not because they would be targeted, uh, but because they would be collateral damage. Um, so I think that's the real risk there. Now, the second question um, about a, a Chinese first strike on American uh, assets, I would say the most likely location where that would occur, possibly, is, is Japan, um, and, and possibly the Philippines as well. Um, but the biggest risk to China is um, you know, US and Japanese troops on Japan that would be involved. Um, and China is convinced, um, Beijing is convinced that both the, for, for reasons that, that we've discussed today, that uh, the US and Japan would both be involved in a war. So, um, you know, would they uh, conduct a first strike to try to uh, delay the response? Or would they hope that, um, that, that the response never occurs? And, uh, and try not to conduct that first strike. That is sort of a, um, th that's an open question, but it's definitely a risk people should think about. I would add one other thing that's related to that. And I would say that um, we have to remember that, um, you know, pl China's plan A is probably not an invasion. I, in fact, we know it's not. They keep saying, uh, you know, they've been very consistent that it's, uh, peaceful unification under one country, two systems. Now we both know one country, two systems is kind of um, fluid. <laughs> and, um, and we know that peaceful unification does mean um, coerced unification. But the way they're doing, you know, the way they hope to accomplish that is through gray zone tactics. And, you know, um, they, they want to exhaust um, uh, Taiwan, make Taiwan feel like it's, it's, it's not, um, like it's hopeless, it's a lost cause. But, do we think that Taiwan is their only target of that? The US is a target of that. Japan is a target of that. And so I do think, and, and if I could like say one more thing, it would be just that um, we need to be vigilant of that and not let that Taiwan is a lost cause. Uh, we, would never, we, we would never be able to defeat a Chinese invasion. China is going to invade any day, and, and um, you know, it's better for us to just step aside. Uh, we need to make sure that does not work, um, does not, um, you know, uh, uh, cause us to back down from our resolve to to uh, support Taiwan, because that is one of the one of the um, uh, one of the intentions of all of the gray zone activity that's happening. Yeah, that's great. Uh, here and then there. <clears throat> Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, how would the United States protect um, like American engineers, intellectual property? We know this is already happening on a level at the university level, um, but also on a professional level. Um, you know, it's becoming a bit of an epidemic, I would think, um, in terms of pursuing that intellectual property, you know, in its foundational stages in in the businesses, you know, the semiconductor uh, companies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, we're, were we doing both questions at once or just one at a time? You could take the second one as well. Okay. Hi, Jeff, Mike. Uh, so I've seen some reports that say that 
you know, and forgive me if you touched on some of this already. I had to take a call. Uh, I've seen some reports that say that China is already well capable of turning Taiwan into the surface of the moon just from their land missiles, uh, not even requiring naval strikes of any kind. So knowing that their policy has been to change the status, to have a fait accompli, change the the boots on the ground status, what is our, it sounds like our best way of helping Taiwan is just to weaken China ultimately. I mean, so how do we, how do we advance this mission knowing that China can operate sort of with impunity in the region with more and more ability day by day? Okay. Um, um, okay, so the, the first question about, um, about intellectual property. Um, I cannot claim to know what, what the U.S. government or the Taiwanese government um, is, is, you know, what their plans are as far as that goes. Um, I, I, I do think it's a really important point because where there's so much talk about, you know, could China take over the, um, uh, the fabs, um, how about, you know, would China be able to, to, to take the minds that, <laughs> that know how to, to run and build the fabs? Um, and so that is, that is a key question. It's not just a question for an invasion scenario. They're actively uh, doing that right now. Um, they're actively working very hard to develop their semiconductor self-sufficiency, and they need intellectual property to do that. So, you know, um, it, it's been going on for decades. It, it will continue. So that, that is um, extremely important. Um, so thanks for mentioning it. Um, the other question, um, um, so I, I, I would push back against the idea that, um, that, that you cited that a lot of people are, uh, are, are saying that, um, you know, that, that China could just bomb Taiwan into smithereens and, you know, that's that. Uh, the CCP knows that it needs boots on the ground. It would need to be able to, it, it doesn't want to just destroy Taiwan. It wants to rule Taiwan. And you know, at the end of the day, um, it does not see the invasion scenario as uh, currently as, as very workable. Um, and, and by the way, the United States um, had an invasion scenario planned in World War II, and we abandoned it. It was not very workable. Um, but um, but they, um, at the end of the day, whether it's uh, so-called peaceful unification or unification in any other way, it would have to put people on the ground. Um, it, that's absolutely essential. So the idea that all it would have to do is just bomb uh, Taiwan, um, that, that is not true. Um, now, as far as <clears throat> your, your question, um, I, I think really the key here, and, and to go back to something Jeff highlighted um, from the report, um, we just have to be comfortable with the fact that this is going to be, it's going to remain an uncomfortable situation. There may be times when cross-strait relations uh, improve as, as they were under, under when Ma ying was president. Um, um, that could happen again. It'll ebb and flow potentially, but the, the trajectory is going to continue to be very difficult. Um, and there is not really a, a, a solution to that. But, you know, you talked about weakening China. I, I do think the U.S. is working to do that. Um, but, um, um, you know, the, the key here as far as Taiwan goes is not, you know, the key here is, is strengthen Taiwan in many ways. You know, um, uh, uh, strengthen it economically, uh, help it out. It, you know, everything we do to support Taiwan, by the way, work very closely with the Taiwanese government. <laughs> They've been dealing with the, Thai, with the China threat for a very long time, and um, we don't need to make them nervous or, uh, you know, we can coordinate timing of certain shows of, of, of support with them to try to minimize uh, the impact of whatever response Beijing might have. Um, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, I, th I think two things here are the key, though. It's ensure that China never feels that it can, uh, that it can take Taiwan at an, at an acceptable cost. 
I judge that it does not feel that way right now. I think it's pretty clear um, that it does not feel that way right now. But we have to ensure that does not, it does not change in that direction. Um, and the other thing is we have to make sure we don't act in a way that will inadvertently spark the war we're trying to, to prevent for reasons that were already discussed. And I, I think one of the points you made there really was a key takeaway for me, which is keep the CCP convinced that a conflict over in the Taiwan Strait would be disastrous for itself and potentially fatal. And one of the principal ways to do that is to make sure Taiwan has the arms necessary to defend itself. So it, bolstering deterrence in the Taiwan Strait, improving our military position in the region, and improving Taiwan's capability to defend itself are apex priorities. I, I, Can I say just one thing about please, arms also please. is keep in mind that Taiwan pays top dollar for, for their arms. This is not a, a charity uh, thing. We, they are buying these arms, which is also good for the US economy. I think we have time for one more question. Um, go ahead. I think, yeah. Bill, uh, North America Taiwanese Professor Association. I, I like your idea when you're saying we have to strengthen Taiwan, but here we got a, a situation here is the people, the weapons, a lot of them, it's never delivered. From my perspective, from American perspective, it's a bad customer services, <laughs> and we need to work on that one. In terms of how to help them, this is the way we can do Give them what they need, and don't give them something like made of boring, whatever something is missing. That's why we need to guarantee safety. The equipment should be done. They pay for it. We need to speed up the process. That's what we should do. Good customer services. Thank you so much for highlighting that. That is a, a key point also made in, in this report. Um, it is um, embarrassing and, and you know, frankly, dangerous that the U.S. Uh, has been unable to provide the arms that almost the vast majority of the arms sold during the Trump administration have not been delivered to Taiwan. So thank you very much for, for making that point. Yeah. Bad customer service on the part of the U.S., as you say. Um, true. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's a point worth underscoring again. I mean, we, if we're talking about China as our country's principal adversary, and Taiwan as the greatest potential flashpoint on the globe, you would think getting munitions, arms, defensive equipment to Taiwan would be the highest order of priority for the United States. Uh, Taiwan is purchasing this equipment um, at you know, a premium, and we're telling them 15 years in some cases. 20 years we'll deliver the platform. On one hand, the window is now, we're in a dire, volatile situation is, is our rhetoric, but we won't get you what you need for another decade plus. That's on us, right? We need to do a better job uh, improving deterrence in the Taiwan Strait. So with that said, thank you to everyone for coming out today. Thank you to Michael. Thank you to Dr. Roberts. And please again soon. Thank you.